Nick Saban signs an extension for the next 100 years. Brian Harson's two biggest obstacles to overcome at Auburn. We update you on the Super Regionals from the SEC side, including the most intriguing one, and recruiting is back open, baby. It's the J-Boy Show. Let's win the water cooler. Welcome to the J-Boy Show, hosted by Jake Crane, the fastest-growing sports show in the nation. I'm Coach Hugh Freeze. This is Super Bowl champion Brandon Graham. Hey, this is DJ Shockley, and you're watching. And you're watching. Hey, thanks for watching the J-Boy Show. Hey, everybody, and thanks for joining us on a solo edition of the J-Boy Show. Going to start doing this a little bit more throughout the week. You're going to see some structure changes. Still bringing you great interviews. You just want to keep adding to the show. I'm going to get to Nick Saban and the contract extension as the rest of the SEC and college football world cringes and hopes he won't go that long. But first, got to give a shout-out to our partners at BetOnline.ag. Head over there today. The, the online casino is always open. They've got a great book right now. You look at NBA playoffs, Major League Baseball, racing, anything you want, whether it's team props, player props, parlays, pleasers, teasers, however you get down. Head over to BetOnline.ag today, and they're going to play the Sharps. Uh, they're going to gamble against you, and the sign-up bonuses are the best that you're going to find out there. That's BetOnline.ag. Head over there today. One of the biggest stories and what is going to be uh, eventually the biggest story in college football, uh, Nick Saban exiting at some point, you would think, the college football and coaching realm, but he just signed a contract extension through 2028. And listen, we've talked about Dan Mullen on here signing contract extensions, and a lot of that is done for recruiting, so other coaches aren't able to go into living rooms and say, hey, this guy's contract's up, he's probably done, uh, you're not going to have a chance to play for him. And in a lot of cases, that's true. It's very true. But when it comes to Nick Saban, I think we're dealing with a different animal right now. I think Nick Saban is not looking to retire anytime soon. I would not be shocked if he coached through the end of his contract. You hear the saying uh, when, when one uh, spouse has another one die and they've been together for a long time and, and the other one dies close, they're heartbroken or, or they don't know how to live without that person. I don't know if Nick Saban, you look at Joe Pond, and go down the list, what he would do if he wasn't coaching college football. And it's not like he's deteriorating. Alabama has been in the AP number one ranked spot at least one week out of the last 13 years. That is an incredible stat. I don't think that will ever be duplicated. It's almost double the second closest team at seven straight years. Recruiting. Alabama is still recruiting at the top level, at the most elite level. He's able to get coaches in and out. He is not losing any, to quote Martin Lawrence off life, any of his exuberance on the sidelines. I think Nick Saban is one of those guys that this is a huge part of who he is. And I think he would tell you that. He's one of the most competitive people all, all, of all time. He's one of the most routine people of all time. And getting out of this space, I don't think he's a guy that you just put on the raft and float down the river and say, hey man, go play golf and have fun or go fish and have fun. I think he could legitimately coach till he's 85 years old, 90 years old, and still be effective. And that is the rare quality that Nick Saban has. Now, are, are there any secrets to it? Uh, I'll say that, listen, you, you don't get tested for HGH when you coach. A lot of coaches use it. A lot of coaches use other things. There's a reason he's able to operate at this level outside of just pure will. And it's smart. It's nothing illegal. And, and it's a great way to go about it if that's something you choose to do. So when you look at Nick Saban, if you're the rest of the SEC, if you're a Texas A&M fan, and you're Jimbo Fisher, and you're hoping he was going to ride off into the sunset, and here comes A&M, not that I don't think A&M is going to compete and be a legitimate contender at some point very quickly and very rapidly, even this year if they get really good play from the quarterback position, but it's not going to be some cruise through and, and Nick Saban's just going to go off to the wayside. If you look at Brian Harson and Auburn, coming in at a time when Georgia is as... Uh, talented as they are, recruiting as well as they are, the monster they have built. We talked about Nick Saban. It's tough. I don't see him leaving anytime soon. I don't think this is an ornament to put on the tree. I don't think this is just for recruiting. I think this is a legitimate contract extension, and I would not be surprised to see Nick Saban uh, end up going out with it. Now, a lot of people have asked, who would take over after Nick Saban? You hear Dabo Sweeney. Well, I'm going to go ahead and give you guys a hint. After some of the things that happened this past week with Clemson having maybe something to do with LSU getting turned in and one other SEC West team that got turned in that a lot of people don't know about, I don't see that happening. I don't think he'd lead the ACC anyway. Why would you do that? When you have a run of the mill in the ACC, you have basically built an SEC team 
in the ACC. My best guess for the next head coach at Alabama is Mario Cristobal out at Oregon. And I would not be shocked 40 years from now, I guess when Nick Saban retires, if Mario takes over. And I think he'd be a good fit. But I will say this. Nobody will ever replicate what Nick Saban has done. It will never be done again. It is the Joe DiMaggio hit streak of college football. I don't care who you put in there. There is going to be a drop-off at some point, and we all know that football is very cyclical. But this run is not ending. It's not close to ending. And I think Nick Saban takes age as a challenge as well. And again, when you're on top and you've got the competitiveness and the ability to do it, why would you stop? Now, Brian Harson, when he took over the Auburn job, there's multiple things that he has to fix that are very important housekeeping stuff, on the field stuff, schematic stuff, recruiting stuff. But the two biggest things, and I've talked about this at nauseum, uh, whether we've had guests, going on the radio, number one is recruiting and evaluating offensive line. Gus Malzahn's biggest weakness at Auburn, and this is the only thing I'm going to say about, the, uh, about that, could not develop offensive line, especially tackles. You look at guys like Braden Smith who go to the NFL and they're just wowed at how different and how unprepared that he was to play at that level. And you see that at the wide receiver position at Auburn and a lot of other places. But when you don't sign a high school offensive tackle since 2017 and you're a run predicated, play action predicated offense, that's going to be a huge problem. The roster is really screwed up in a lot of spots. And I'm going to get to that in a second. I want to stick to the recruiting. And if you look at what Brian Harson has done, all right, you get the, the flip from Colby Smith in Tennessee when you come in, even though Tennessee's had a lot of problems. Auburn is offering everybody under the sun in the 2022-2023 class at offensive tackle and even some 2024. And he has to do that to start developing depth there. But it's not just about trying to sign everybody. It's about evaluating. One of the hardest things to do as a coach, we talk about closing recruits and being good with the families. That's not the hardest part. The hardest part is evaluating projecting. And that's something that Brian Harson, whether it's been at Boise, whether it's been at Arkansas State, hell, even when he's co-OC at Texas, they've been able to evaluate offensive linemen and turn those guys into quality players at a very high level. Everybody wants to sign the four and five, five, uh, four and five stars. I'm telling you right now, Auburn is not going to sign a ton of four-star and five-star offensive linemen. At least not right now. You have to win that on the field. You can't just sign those guys with promises unless you just luck into somebody uh, that has a family member on the staff or, or that is fortunate enough now in today's recruiting society that want to stick to the team they grew up in. That's different. But they're not going to go and sign the Amarius Mims right now. They have to win on the field. You do that by beating Georgia. You do that by beating Alabama. That gives you instant credi credibility. The new football field house, that's great. But you got to put a winner in there or it's just a big, nice building. And that's one of Brian Harson's biggest, I would say, mountains to climb that he really has no control over until they're able to play on the field. Now, Will Friend, Auburn's new offensive line coach, is a hell of a recruiter. You just look at the track record. But again, they have to establish themselves from a Southeast standpoint, and you're still not going to go and get all the four and five star guys the way that Alabama is, the way that Georgia is. What you have to be able to do right now if you're Brian Harson is find not under the radar guys, but scour the nation, which they have. They're offering guys from Queens, from Washington. Hell, if they find a guy on Neptune that's going to have to play, they're probably going to offer him too. And no longer is it, okay, uh, we didn't sign the big guys from the Southeast, so I guess we'll just try and go Juco, uh, or we'll try and uh, sign a guy that really has no chance to develop. And you can see that on Auburn's roster right now, which brings me to the second biggest hurdle that Brian Harson has to get over. Roster management. You know, I keep seeing on Twitter that term starting to be used in the college game by a lot of our listeners and audience and even, even other people kind of in this profession, and it is a breath of fresh air. Uh, the pure Nicolas Cage from Con Air GIF when he gets off the bus and that wind hits, his, hits him in the face. Because we don't talk about it enough. All we talk about in the NFL, free agency, roster management, roster management, this guy's hired for this, GM's hired here, player personnel. It's very similar in college. You have GMs in college, I promise you. They just go by a different name. You've had player personnel guys for a long time, but for some reason, we don't talk about it. And if you look at Nick Saban, you look at Kirby Smart, you look at the guys that really are able to have themselves and put their teams in position to win a championship almost every year. 
which is one of the hardest things to do. They have a balanced roster. People ask, okay, balanced roster, what does that mean? It means that you never lose too much at too many important places at the same time. And when you do, you've recruited and supplemented yourself well enough to fill in guys that may not have experience, which they will gain, but they have the ability and the IQ and the will to do it. And they've seen guys do it before them. Auburn has five junior offensive tackles on the roster. Four now that one has hit the portal. Not many of those guys are quality tackles and you have five. So what does that mean? That means you would lose five offensive tackles if they all stayed in one year. That can never happen. That should never happen. And it's not just there. You look at the quarterback room. What would have happened if Auburn didn't sign TJ Finley? I think they would have went and got the Sears kid from Boise or, or somebody from there just to supplement it because you have Bo Nix that's a true junior. Grant Loy, and again, I hate to hate on Grant Loy. I'm sure he's a great guy. He cannot throw you to a win. He can't win you a game. Can't do it. So if Bo Nix were to get hurt this year, outside of the walk-ons, you'd have a true freshman, Demetrius Davis, having to come in and play. A junior and a true freshman. And again, you're always one play away. Or what if Bo Nix doesn't play well? And you have to take him out and send a message. That's not the position you want to be in at a place like Auburn in a division like the SEC West. And let's go even further. What happened if they didn't sign TJ Finley and you go into next year? What if Bo Nix had an amazing year his junior year, goes to the NFL, or has a horrible year and wants to transfer for his last year? Now you have either a true sophomore in Demetrius Davis that may have got a little bit of playing time, but it's probably still isn't ready. Or you have a redshirt freshman, Demetrius Davis, who didn't get any playing time, and a true freshman backup in Holden Gariner behind him. That's a disaster from a quarterback room and really any room flow to your classes. So the main reason they got TJ Finley was to even out the quarterback room. Now Demetrius Davis can redshirt as a true freshman, can get in the throwing program, can see what it's like, can travel, can go through the practices on the scout team, can earn his due and be ready when he steps on the field. Bo Nix, something happens this year. TJ Finley has experience, even as a true freshman, which you're gonna get up and down. So you're not just throwing somebody into the fire willy-nilly. Bo Nix plays great. You got a guy that can come in and clean up duty, do fine, you don't have to worry about him. But he also puts pressure on Bo Nix to play well. As good as Demetrius Davis is as a true freshman, Bo Nix is a smart person. He knows what it's like to be a true freshman playing in the SEC. He was the exception, not the rule. So he really wouldn't be looking over his shoulder, in my opinion. But now, he will be. And going into next year, let's use that same scenario that we used without TJ Finley, now with him. Bo Nix has a great year, goes to the NFL. Now you have a junior in TJ Finley, if he got some playing time, a redshirt freshman in Demetrius Davis, and a true freshman and Holden Gariner. You're much more even and have a lot more depth than what you started with and experience. Makes a lot of sense, right? You have to take that thought that he's shown in the quarterback room and supplement it in pretty much every other room outside of a couple. That was Gus Malzahn's biggest problem outside of not evolving his offense was roster management. And that is how you get let go. And that is one of the two biggest hurdles that Brian Harson has to get over. Speaking about hurdles, if you're trying to get over the hurdle of getting your son, daughter, friend of yours, any prospect seen by college coaches, you need to download the Dynasty U app right now while it's still free. It's in the Google Play Store, anywhere you get your apps. It's a fantastic app. It's like LinkedIn for high school prospects. Instead of emailing the coach 30,000 times uh, on, hey, look at my son, this is what he did, this, that, and the other, which I promise you they're gonna get fed up or just push on to one of the analysts or somebody in that recruiting department and nothing will ever happen. Now it's concise. They can get everything there. 
the GPA, social media, highlights, makes it more efficient for them. The college coaches love it just as much as the high school parents, guardians, or whoever, even the prospect, if you're filling one out yourself. So go la- download the Dynasty U app today. It's free. It's fantastic stuff. And get it while it's free because it's really popping off, I promise you guys, and it's very interesting to see. Now, recruiting is back open. And to be honest with you, the biggest winners in this whole thing, because listen, it's great for the coaches and, and the evaluators and stuff like that, but the biggest winners are the kids and the families. And I, my heart breaks for the kids last year that weren't able to go to camps because we all know the, the under the radar kids, the hidden gems that nobody really knew about or a coach drove up uh, from the middle of nowhere and they go to camp and they ball out against some of the top competition, the four and five stars and all the elite prospects and they earn an offer. Not only do they earn an offer, they earn a free education. Then they get to go play in the NFL and change their lives because they got an opportunity and they took advantage of it. Those kids didn't get that last year. And I just hope and pray for all those kids that would have gotten that chance, that would have gotten that offer, that would have changed their future, that they can find a path. Also, you guys know as well as I do, being able to see something in person, not only as a player, but as a parent, is huge. This is where they're they're giving you their baby, their son, their daughter, the most prized possession that they have on earth. And you damn better believe that they want to know what it looks like, who's around, what's the community like, look the coaches in the eyes and be able to get a real feel for if that person's going to be able to take care of their son or if they're just promising, promising them the moon and only going to give them the stratosphere. That's a big deal. And on the other side, the college campuses, there's some, I mean, you look at Auburn, you look at Tennessee, and and listen, Alabama and Georgia and all them recruited at a high clip regardless. They're going to. The teams that are winning, the five, six teams that we always talk about in the playoff, or that we always talk about in the NFL draft, the the players from, they're going to recruit well. But these other schools that are trying to compete, that are trying to climb the mountain, they need that on-campus visit. Because that could be the difference at the end in them having a chance to close on a kid that they wouldn't get if that situation wasn't there. And Auburn is a prime example. You can go down the list. There's a bunch of them. So it's, it's amazing to get back to some sense of normalcy. And right now, you've got one of the, the, the coolest things, in my opinion, guys that are coming up for visits, but guys that are coming up to work out too while they're having a visit. And listen, players have been working out for coaches in closed doors uh, for a long time. And there's rules against it and stuff like that. To me, it really makes no sense, especially if it's a solo workout. Uh, now, if you're trying to bring guys up there and use it as a recruiting tool, that's one thing. But now kids are going up there and being able to work out while visits are going on. It's just a very interesting dynamic. And I want to see what one of those itineraries look like because it's already hectic uh, trying to put together a great official visit itinerary and keep track of all the kids. And you have kids in tier one, kids in tier two, kids in tier three. And now you have to work them out and evaluate them uh, in the weight room as well. It's almost turned into a visit slash combine, which I think is pretty cool. I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with it at all. But if you mix that, recruiting being back open, Dead period being done. Now we're in the alive period, the awakening, the renaissance, it's back. You mix that with the transfer portal and it is absolute breaking news pandemonium. And it's great fodder for fans of of college football. It's excellent. I mean, the content, we already know recruiting, it never stops. But you add this now with the free agency, and I'm going to get to the new SEC rule in a second because I do have some thoughts on that. But now that that you've gotten to this point, it's like a tidal wave has hit another tidal wave and you're able to supplement your team not only with high school kids that you're trying to get commitments from, which you'll see a flurry of commitments if these visits are open. Then I think once we get into the season, they're going to get into that same routine and kind of timeline. Because listen, there's an old saying and it's true, the big dogs walk late. But now you're able to literally add experienced players to your team. Because... What is the one thing that recruits out of high school don't have that coaches cannot replace until they get it or can't put in them until they get them there? It's experience. I promise you, 100% of coaches will take a guy that's a good locker room fit, that's a good player that's going to be productive, and understands the physical and mental grind of a season and what it's like to be out on that field. Because the whole goal of practice is to try and make practice more important than the game and try and simulate the game in practice. But it's impossible to simulate the environment and the speed that you get in the game 
and the way you think in practice. The goal is to get as close to it as possible. But now you're able to go get guys that understand that. And my only question is, if this new rule stands, which I don't know how you close Pandora's box once you open it. If you didn't hear, the SEC, a lot of other conferences, the Big Ten will do it eventually. They're going to have to. You can now transfer inside the conference with no penalty. I hope this is a one-year deal. I hope this isn't precedent because it really turns it into free agency and there's going to be a lot of problems. You talk about recruiting violations. You talk about tampering. We talk about tampering in the NFL. It's going to be some, some KGB-level tampering going on here during the season. What's going to stop, let's just say, for example, Auburn's playing Tennessee, and it's a, it's a blowout. Let's say Auburn's, I just use this as an example. Auburn's up 35 to nothing. What's going to stop Auburn's player personnel guys and some of the extra guys they have there uh, watching certain things on the field from looking at the backups on the other side and going, hey, we're losing five junior tackles after this year, and this backup tackle they have looks pretty good. Tennessee's having a terrible season. They've got NCAA problems. Uh, there's no momentum. Let's go try and get this kid. Now, I'm not saying that, that they would tamper, and I'm just using that as an example, but you don't think that would happen in some cases? You don't think that would be looked at? I don't like that because it takes away from the purity what's left of the game. But now, when you look at some of the transfer portal moves that have been made and some of the kids, maybe a three-star that instead of getting a late scholarship offer because the team missed on somebody, they're just going to go get a kid that's already in college. So who does that help? To me, it helps the group of five. I think the group of five is going to start getting a lot more three stars, some lower level, maybe four stars that become three stars because these bigger colleges aren't going to supplement it with a guy that is almost going to be a project or, or they don't think is as highly valuable uh, as a high four star, or five star, or somebody at that level. Why would they not go get a kid that's already played that may have been a backup, but he has experience. He physically knows what's going on. So that's something to really pay attention to because there's a ripple effect in this rule. Now, I believe that if you're going to transfer outside of this year, because last year was crazy, I understand that. I feel like it should be a one-year deal because if this continues to roll, it sets a very dangerous precedent to me and it's going to cause a civil war inside a conference, I, I promise you. Because there's unwritten rules in the SEC and some other conferences. Coaches typically don't turn in other coaches for recruiting violations unless it's something really bad or involves their team. We've already seen and heard allegations of tampering, guys getting in the portal, and then all of a sudden committing somewhere else very quickly. Wow, they must have had a change of heart really quick. So what's going to stop this from blooming and blossoming into something where everybody's turning everybody in, and we almost have a red scare in the SEC of, of, of the McCarthy days, the McCarthyism of the SEC, where everybody's worried about everybody turning in everybody, and this guy's a secret agent trying to get this kid going there. What happens if a coach, an offensive line coach from one school, and uh, again, you just saw an offensive line coach from Arkansas go to LSU. What's going to stop him from trying to take some of the guys that he coached on that roster and bring them over with him? What are the rules on that? It's tampering. It's illegal. But how can you stop it? It creates a lot of problems that I'm very interested to see how they handle. But you mix that with the portal, with recruiting being wide open, and we do got a ton of news, and it's going to get even crazier. And, and I want to close today's show with this. And, and we've hit some different points. Postseason baseball. What an amazing weekend, early week of college baseball. From walk-off grand slams for Tennessee, LSU going out to Oregon and winning the regional uh, after struggling early, the Mississippi schools advancing, Arkansas being Arkansas playing cops and robbers, Shout out Eric Musselman. That was a great conversation on Twitter and the Timeline. Coach, excited to get you on the show. But you had drama at the highest level. And it's really tough to beat postseason baseball in the format that it's in. You know, I've, I've said March Madness is the greatest postseason event, sporting event that there is, and I'm going to stick by that. But watching some of these storylines and watching some of these SEC teams that advance, and a lot of them we knew were going to advance, Florida was kind of a surprise uh, the way they played. Shout out to my alma mater, South Alabama, for knocking them and Miami out. Uh, and, and we know that a and didn't make it. Auburn didn't make it. Alabama took an early exit uh, as well. But the SEC, there's some, there's some damn good super regional matchups. But one really stands out to me. LSU and Tennessee. And not just because it's an interconference matchup 
which you know I'm not a huge fan of. And and I know I guess when you get as many teams in the tournament as the SEC does, it's going to happen eventually. It's kind of like me seeing SEC teams play each other in the second round of the NCAA tournament. I, I just I don't like it. And again, when you have that many teams, I guess stuff like that happens. But Tennessee, to me, if you look at a, at a program that needed this, that needed one of the three major sports to have a breakthrough year, this was the program. Football has been down in the dumps. We all know that. I'm not going to get into that. I've talked about Josh Heifel and all this stuff. Basketball, underachieving. It's the truth. All the negative NCAA connotations and the Jeremy Pruitt exit and how ugly that was, the Dylan Brooks stuff and how ugly that was. And then you have Tennessee baseball and Coach V really taking the spotlight and having a hell of a year. And you see the Tennessee fan base. They are unbelievably passionate. And they don't want you to feel sorry for them. Trey Wallace, we've had him on Rocky Top Insider all the time. They don't want you to feel sorry for them. But they needed this. That energy in Knoxville is real. It's palpable. And I'm really excited for that fan base and excited for that club. But this LSU-Tennessee matchup should be an all-out fistfight. LSU, uh, to me, being able to win that regional without having their top guys swinging the bat well. That shows you that they're a good baseball team. We know LSU is a good baseball team. They're very young. But there's something about your coach. And again, listen, you can say what you want about Paul Maneri. Guy's got 1,500 wins. He's beloved by his players. There's something about the swan song and getting behind a guy uh, that, that has your back, that makes you play better, that takes it to that next level. That's what made that last out so special in that Eugene Regional for LSU. Then you take that storyline and you blend it with Tennessee's storyline of the fan base finally getting success in a major three sport, getting on the map in baseball, and they're about to throw the absolute bank at Coach V over there, and he deserves it. I don't think it's a one-hit wonder. I think he's building a program over there, and I don't think he's leaving. I think you're going to see Schlossnagel at A&M. You know, there's been a lot of talk about Kevin O'Sullivan. We're recording this uh, on Tuesday uh, at about noon. I'm sure news is going to break probably in the next couple days. Uh, but Kevin O'Sullivan's on the list, and I've heard Pat Casey, former Oregon State legendary coach. Now, he's 62 years old, but you've got some movement there. But I am so excited to watch this series. I think it's going to be high-scoring games. I think you're going to get, I think it's going to go three, and I think you're going to get three high-scoring games, but I love the storylines. And there's a lot more in college baseball that have been fantastic. But I'm I cannot wait to watch this. Uh, you look at Ole Miss, you look at uh, Mississippi State, uh, and, and I've just got to say, Tim Elko, you talk about a gamer, a guy out there in his senior year, the captain, the captain, playing on a torn ACL in a must-win game, steps up to the plate and starts knocking him over the fence early and often to the point they got intentional walk -on. You want to talk about sending a message? If you're an Ole Miss fan, I'm, I, I'm not surprised. I'm surprised y'all weren't chewing through the fence watching this guy. Can barely run. Tim Elko is the Kirk Gibson of college baseball right now. I wish on one of those home runs he would have gave the, the Kirk Gibson fist pump going around second base. What a story. What a team. And I hope Mike Bianco wins it. Because I'm tired of hearing Ole Miss fans. And I know I, it's not all of you. Not hating on Bianco, and I know you want to win it. It's like Georgia in football. I know you want to win it. But I will caution you, like I caution Georgia fans, about trying to get rid of Kirby Smart. You don't know what you have until it's gone. Ask Philip Fulmer in Tennessee. Ask Tennessee, Tennessee fans about that. They could write a Harry Potter-length book about it. So make sure you appreciate what you have. And I hope they win it, and I think they got a chance. Now, my money's still on Arkansas especially now that they got through that because those guys don't know how to lose and they're dominant. Once Cops comes in, man, that dude is special. That dude is special and he's a gamer. But so many great storylines in college baseball. We appreciate you joining us today on the J-Boy Show. Make sure you head over and subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify uh, as well. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at the J-Boy Show. Keep spreading the word. We're going to SEC Media Days. We're about to blow this thing up now. Uh, we've, been telling you it's, we've been trying to tell you it's coming. Uh, we've done a little bit of, of, you know, had some NBA stuff and this, that, and the other. But we are starting to march toward this SEC football season. We got baseball right here, and we're going to start adding solo shows like this, some scripted shows. Still going to be bringing the interviews just like uh, usual. We're going to start blending in interviews with the shows 
and we're gonna start going live here very soon. There's gonna be content galore, uh, and it's gonna be very interactive with fans as well. And also make sure you buy some merchandise from thejboyshow.com. It's been another edition of The J Boy Show, and J Boy's going, going. Like Tim Elko at the plate. Gone. The J Boy Show is produced by David Cohn, Technical Director Dave Hammock, Creative Director David Culbertson, Audio Engineer Faison Sharif, Production Assistants Blaine Crane and Kyle Orr, Executive Producers Jake Crane, Vince Thompson, Steve Chamberlain, and David Cohn. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit our website, thejboyshow.com, for updates regarding our newest apparel and merch designs. Win the water cooler with The J Boy Show.